further delay from me, I'm going to go ahead and pass you over to tonight's presenter, the wonderful Dr. Leo. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Uh, let me just share my slides. So I'm going to start with a quick uh, intro video. I always enjoyed uh, these when I go to the talk, so I thought I'd start with one, uh, just a little bit about dark matter. Everything you've ever seen, touched or known, is made of the same stuff, the same building blocks, tiny particles called matter. From the smallest bug to the tallest tree to the vastest galaxy and everything in between. But ask a physicist and they'll tell you most of this matter may be missing. Over 80% of it may be hidden undetectable, unreachable, yet still right here, all around us. This is a dark particle, a form of matter beyond anything we've encountered before, everywhere, yet impossible to reach. These dark particles, this shadow universe, may unlock the next frontier of physics, the missing link that tells us how we came to be and where we are going. If only we could shine a light. Sounds like science fiction? It's not. We're doing it here in the UK. Dark Matter UK is an alliance of scientists and universities building new technologies that will detect this particle. Experimenters, theoreticians, even astronomers. We are operating in cutting-edge laboratories, in computer simulations, and even deep underground, all over the world. Our work is empowering a global effort, a new wave of exploration at the frontiers of science. And whatever we find, it'll just be the start. The future is dark. Uh, that's actually a very dramatic introduction. <laughs> well, okay, that was quite a dramatic introduction, but good evening, everyone. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers, Kirsty and Martha, and everyone from TechFest for inviting me to give uh, this talk on the global hunt for dark matter. Uh, and I would also like to thank everyone for taking interest and tuning in today. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there in person. I, I love uh, in-person science festivals, but thanks to the wonders of the internet, we can still all meet and talk about science, which is uh, a lot of fun. So yeah, so without further ado, I just wanted to kick things off with a little bit more about me. Uh, I am an STFC leadership fellow working at the University of Edinburgh's particle physics group. Uh, I did my PhD at the University College London and the Mullard Space Science Laboratory. So on a particle physics experiment called uh, Super Nemo in the field of neutrino physics. Uh, so in total, I've spent about 10 years of my life uh, as a professional hunter of the invisible, and I got to do it in some of the most beautiful places, as you can see in these pictures. But I also got to spend a lot of that time underground, so they don't let me above ground very often, actually. So it's very nice to be on the surface and talking to you all. And uh, I'll come and talk a little bit more about why that is later on. Um, so speaking of uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, I wanted to start with our own professor, Peter Higgs, and the discovery of the Higgs boson, which was announced on the 4th of July, 2012, uh, a day that is now referred to as Higgs Dependence Day. This discovery came almost 50 years after it was first predicted to exist, and uh, which is quite remarkable, and it further validates, and in many ways, it completes the standard model of particle physics. Uh, which is one of the most rigorously tested models in science today. Uh, and, you know, despite that level of rigor and how well it performs, we know it has to be flawed because it does not account for gravity or the dark universe. So it is a very successful model that uh, describes approximately 5% of our universe. Uh, and, and already the cracks uh, are starting to show on the wall. And, uh, and you know, the, the story of dark matter really goes much further than uh, back in time than Professor Higgs to the uh, 1900s, where with people like Lord Kelvin he, uh, here in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, and later Fritz Wicke at Caltech in California were proposing the existence of something called dark matter. 
Uh, but it wasn't really until the 70s when Vera Rubin, the famous US astronomer, uh, made her measurements of galaxy rotations uh, when she was looking at the way these stars uh, around the galaxies moved. Um, that she, and she was expecting that as the star moved further away from the galactic center, they would move slower as predicted from the work of Sir Isaac Newton, who was uh, back then and remains today a giant in the world of physics. But instead, she measured that they moved just as fast as those at the center. Uh, and this was a, a interesting discovery. And this linked to the idea that there must be something out there holding the galaxies together and making them rotate at this speed. And we cannot really see it, hence why it's called dark matter. But also dark here really means our, our lack of knowledge of just what this uh, matter and this material out there is. So um, yeah, so you, you can see here the difference from the expected from, uh, from the work of Sir Isaac Newton to those that uh, Vera Rubin actually measured. So of course you might say maybe there is no dark matter and gravity just work maybe differently on large scales. And that could be true, and it does sound good, but it doesn't really fit the data because since the 70s, uh, we've also had a lot more evidence from other sources. Uh, and each time they come to support this idea of the existence of dark matter. And in fact, everywhere we look in our universe, we see a need for dark matter to explain our observations. Uh, and so where we are now, while, uh, uh, while scientists know that there should be more matter in the universe than we can see, and measurements show part of the matter of the universe is missing, uh, but sadly we have yet to find it. And, and there are, you know, this is just kind of highlights the excitingness of this area is that there are almost many theories of what dark matter could be as there are theoretical physicists out there, um, but some, more, some are more strongly supported whilst other, uh, and many have been ruled out in the years over the past few years. Um, but, you know, so far all of that evidence uh, that we've gathered and the theories you have come from uh, uh, from observations of dark matter of the existence of dark matter from astronomical sources and to summarize what we've known so far about dark matter then is that if it does exist this matter uh, neither emits or absorb light and it, it doesn't have any charge within it and that is why we call it dark uh, it's also stable because galaxies have persisted for billions of years uh, and it does not interact uh, with the strong force. So there are four fundamental forces in science. Um, so electromagnetism, uh, gravity, strong and weak forces. Uh, so we, we don't think it interacts via, uh, we know it interacts via gravity. Uh, we don't think it interacts via the strong force as we see no evidence of cosmic rays made of protons interacting with it. Uh, and then we, we know it doesn't interact via the electromagnetism. Um, yeah, so, the, so, so, you know, so the only source left really out there is that the scientists postulate that dark matter might experience the weak force. Uh, and, you know, so why do we think dark matter interact via the weak force? The, the, the boring answer and maybe the easy answer is that if it doesn't, we wouldn't be able to detect it. But um, but that's not a very good answer. A better answer might be that uh, it involves the Higgs boson, which we mentioned earlier with Peter Higgs, uh, because the Higgs field gives mass to ordinary matter. Uh, maybe it also gives mass to dark matter. Uh, and then further, since the Higgs field was invented to solve a problem with early attempts to unify the weak and natural magnetism forces, maybe, maybe this interaction of the Higgs boson with dark matter also ties dark matter to the weak force. And, th and this would be great, uh, as we know from experience in particle physics, we become very good at detecting uh, particles that interact via this, this weak force, the fourth channel that's left to us unexplored. Uh, and, and, you know, so this means uh, that we are looking now for a dark matter candidate called a weakly interacting massive particle or a WIMP. Uh, the name is quite literal. Uh, and does not necessary that it, it, dark matter doesn't necessarily have to be a weakly interacting uh, particle, uh, but if it does not interact via this last channel available to us to to, to detect it, uh, we'll probably never detect it directly in a laboratory setting. So, so in short, our success of our dark matter search right now depends on uh, dark matter being a little bit wimpy. Uh, 
And so that's what we know so far. And as I mentioned, what scientists really want to do now is to be able to measure dark matter in a laboratory setting. And this would then allow us to learn a lot more about its properties. Uh, and, and to do that, there are broadly three ways to go about uh, detecting it. And you can, and they're broadly broken into, you can make it, break it, or shake it. So you can make it in a collider like the LHC at CERN. Uh, you can break it by looking for dark matter annihilation signatures uh, coming from space using instruments on board the International Space Station. Uh, or you can uh, shake, the shake it method is where you make a large target and you wait for dark matter to smash into your detector and see it that way. And this third method has really been the most successful method of dark matter searches to date and the method which I work on and I will focus on today mostly. So onto the, some of the challenges with detecting for dark matter uh, with a large mass. Uh, and the, the main challenge, it comes from the fact that we live on planet Earth, which is unfortunately a radioactive planet. And in the case of dark matter, the signature of the process that we're looking for is very similar to that of natural radioactivity. I don't want to panic anybody. The amount of radiation uh, around us, sitting around us on this table and things, there are elements, tiny amounts of uranium and thorium, but they are so small, they pose no harm to us. Uh, but because the process we're looking for is so rare, uh, you know, it could become a major background for us uh, when we're looking for something that happens so rarely. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's really so searching for dark matter surrounded by radioactivity. I always say it's like searching for a needle in a haystack, uh, except in our case, the haystack is really massive. Um, so the solution to how to get rid of that uh, radioactivity background is uh, is Russian dolls. Well, sadly, not literally Russian dolls, uh, but it's all about building shells or shields, or sometimes we call them castles, which are used to protect our detectors from background radiation. And uh, firstly, you, you don't you don't want to build your detector on the surface of the Earth because it's going to get bombarded by millions of background radi uh, radiation as a result of cosmic rays coming from space. So we, we then have no chance of seeing dark matter collisions, which might only happen a few times per year when we're swamped by millions of events uh, per second. So uh, the first thing we do then is to go underground. Uh, <clears throat> and so here it's really a game of location, 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 because there are about 10 deep underground laboratories around the world where you can, uh, so I, I've shown a little plot here and a little map where you can see all the world's underground laboratories, their depth and size of each of those laboratories. So I think the size of the circles is how big the labs are. And then here's how deep they go. Um, so not all labs here are available for you to host the dark matter detector. Some are decommissioned. Others are dedicated to a single experiment like the ice cube experiment in the South Pole, uh, which is why I said there are roughly about 10 labs out there. <clears throat> and in the UK, we have our own Bowlby Underground Laboratory, which has operated since the late 80s and where I've worked since 2013. And of course, one of the best facilities in the world, um, but I am biased in that fact. So let's have a look at Bowlby then, uh, this wonderful facility. This photo was taken outside the Bowlby Underground Laboratory and it won a photography award in 2019, uh, which proves that you know, we're not only an excellent science facility, but also an awesome underground science uh, photo studio. Um, but uh, so the, let's, before I go and talk about the lab, just a little bit about the mine. Uh, the Bowlby mine is located in the Northeast coast of England. Uh, near the town of Whitby. Um, it's a working potash polyhalite and rock salt mine, and it's a major local employer. It employs some 700 people directly and 3,000 people indirectly, and it excavates some 40 kilometers of tunnel each year as it uh, extracts uh, its um, material from underground. So, so within this wonderful uh, underground, deep underground facility, uh, it meant because these tunnels are 1.1 kilometers underground, it meant that it was a perfect location to build dark matter detectors. And indeed, scientists have uh, realized this and been building dark matter detectors since the, the uh, 1990s. Uh, so you can see here on the left, 
uh, lots of uh, historically lots of different labs, and, and you know they really started from very humble beginnings. Uh, so here is literally a real like actual garden shed with a tent, uh, which were some of the first dark matter detectors operating. Uh, but then as the ambitions grew of these detectors, so did the size of them, the detectors, and then also subsequently the size of the labs needed to host these uh, these experiments. So you can see over the years, the labs have slowly grown in size uh, until finally this new lab, uh, which is the blue one replacing the red one here, <clears throat> was opened in 2017. Uh, it's a brand new facility that is fantastic for uh, current UK science. Uh, but with the new lab, we did lose one amazing feature, which was my favorite of the old lab, which was that in the case of a fire, uh, one must escape by taking a fire axe and hacking your way out of the lab, which I think is just absolutely fantastic <clears throat> in case of a zombie apocalypse. But, but sadly, it has been replaced. But in its place, we have a wonderful underground science facility, state of the art. The entire lab is a class 10,000 clean room. Uh, and what that really means is that as I sit in my office here, I'm relatively clean, uh, I, there will be some 100,000 to a million particles per cubic feet around me. Um, but in this lab at Bowlby, there are 10,000 or less than 10,000 particles per cubic feet there. And that is remarkable if you think about it's set in a working mine surrounded by huge amounts of dust. Uh, and, uh, you know, so to get it to that level of cleanliness is incredible. And within that, uh, there is a further dedicated low background facility, which is a class 1000 clean room. And in total, there's some 4,000 cubic meters of experimental space with a four meter high, seven meter wide main hall, uh, you know, which is a wonderful location to do uh, deep underground science. So here are some pictures. And, you know, we are hosted and supported uh, by the mine itself, uh, CPL, ICL, support us in many, many ways, keeping the mine operational and safe, providing health and safety, material transportation, and facility maintenance. And they're just, the, the mining community is just one of the most wonderful people to work with. Uh, and it's been an absolute delight. And as you can see through these pictures, you know, the first before that I ever went to Bowlby, I remember looking it up and thinking, wow, going to Bowlby is like, going to Mars. And then little did I know that that, that thought was more correct than I realized, because um, I think NASA and ESA have also realized this, uh, the nature that is 1.1 kilometers underground, that because of that, it's always 40 degrees Celsius in the tunnels and incredibly dry. They, they discovered that <clears throat> it's a very nice place to test the next generation of Mars rovers. And there have been some really interesting science uh, happening around the dark matter uh, search experiment. So Bowlby has now really become a multidisciplinary science facility, uh, you know, especially when they discover there are life living in the Bowlby salt, uh, when, they, when they sampled the brine at Bowlby using the, these instruments designed for Mars uh, exploration of life on Mars, they discovered there were life in the Bowlby salt uh, that, have not been, that have been there for over 200 million years. So, you know, it's an incredible discovery. And again, another excellent reason why, uh, you know, there has been yearly themed workshops for astrobiologists, geologists, and biologists from around the world coming to Bowlby, uh, NASA and ESA testing the next generation of uh, Mars rovers. Uh, and, and yeah, and then that is, has set to happen again this year, later in December. So uh, check out the Bowlby website uh, for more information and there should be some live streams from the teams testing the rovers near the time in December. Uh, and another wonderful project I just want to mention because this is my personal project I lead is the remote cubed uh, uh, project which aims to deliver a, a STEM outreach to some of the most remote areas of Scotland. Uh, the project is aimed at S1 to S3 students uh, that's between 11 to 14 year olds in 10 Scottish high schools. Uh, teams of four to six students are assembled per school and they design, build and program a miniature Mars rover. This is then sent to the underground lab uh, and the STFC Mars yard uh, where they have opportunity to remotely control it and explore the Mars yard. So if you want to learn more about this awesome project and all the other awesome experiments happening at Bowlby, uh, check out their, their social media pages and their brand new website, which launched recently as part of uh, 
and, and also the remote cubed uh, website, which launched recently as part of the National Coding Week and the Bobby website, which is also really interesting. So yeah, so I, I kind of talked about just a small range of the broad experiments taking place at Bowlby. Uh, and there are other things like carbon storage underground, renewable energy generation, <clears throat> or life in extremely low radiation environments. Uh, so yeah, again, if you're interested in those, check out the Bowlby website. It has lots of really inf interesting information and facts. But returning to the main focus of Bowlby, which has always been a dark matter laboratory, the, the idea that so there was an idea that neutrino detectors can also be made to detect dark matter, uh, which was first proposed in 1985. And this was put into action in, in 86 at the Homestake mine in the US, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. But the, the first UK dark matter experiment was carried out in 1987 at Bowlby. And we'll go through some of those uh, in a little bit more detail uh, as, we, uh, yeah, as we explore the history of dark matter to date. Uh, it was a so the first dark matter detector was a germanium made out of germanium uh, because we had the technology to grow very clean germanium uh, to about a few uh, kilograms or so and this was very humble beginning I, I think this is the picture we saw earlier in the talk uh, of the UK's effort for direct dark matter detection and the person in this picture now actually <clears throat> the person you see here uh, is now the director of the Triumph Particle Accelerator Center in Canada. And he was also, as I recently discovered, the first Brit to ever winter over at the South Pole. So that's quite an interesting fact I found out just recently. Uh, and, then the, and then we moved on to other experiments uh, called NIAD, which was located also at Bowlby, a uh, similar concept. And then, and then the experiment scale increased with, with a detector called Drift, which is slightly different from the others because it's a directional detector, which means they can work out the direction the dark matter particle is traveling in. Um, and the original drift is now at the Science Museum in London, but an upgraded version of the experiment called Cygnus is still operating at Bowlby today. Um, so yeah, so, so then um, after that, we moved to one of the most revolutionary dark matter detectors, uh, the Zeppelin program, which started with Zeppelin 1, uh, which we see here is just a desktop size detector but it uses xenon as the detection medium. Uh, and this, now, this detector is now sitting uh, on display at Polaris House. Um, and then one was followed by two, not surprisingly, uh, the first detector, but the second Zeppelin II is the, the revolutionary technology because it's the first detector to use a dual phase uh, xenon detector, which means that xenon is both in liquid and gas forms. And, and uh, this technique has since become the world leading technology for dark matter detection uh, and it was really pioneered here in the UK. Um, so yeah, so that, that's a very iconic detector. And then they rapidly scaled up to a Zeppelin 3, which was the first detector to test some high electric fields uh, in the detector to, uh, to kind of improve the detector performance. Uh, and then this detector was housed in this large lead castle, as we were talking about earlier, building these shells to protect your detector from radiations uh, attacking it from all sides. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so then e with each new generation of detector, we're getting much more uh, sensitive, so more uh, able to detect dark matter successfully. Uh, and now, you know, Zeppelin 3 is on display at the Whitby Museum of Treasures. So if you ever happen to be passing the beautiful town of Whitby, uh, do check it out. It's wonderful to see. And then uh, now, uh, before we go on, I just want to give you a little journey to show you what it's like to travel to a deep underground facility. So I'm going to see if this video plays. Uh -huh. It does. I'm going to try to turn the sound down a little bit, though. Um, because well, it has very lively music, but um, just to give you some information, yes. Yeah, so as you see, we're all in our bright high vis orange outfits. Um, as we go to the mine, you have to take your uh, helmet, all the health um, P uh, PPE equipment, uh, and then you have your tag, which you give at the top of the mine, and then the second tag, which you return when you come back up to the surface so that they know that you're underground or on the surface and have made it back out. And then you go into this cage and you and seven minutes of darkness later, you arrive at the 1.1 kilometer um, uh, underground 
mine. And then it's a short 600, some 600 meter walk to the lab. And you can see it's in, uh, much of it is in darkness. Uh, and of course, the, the, the miners themselves have to then get in cars and drive uh, further to the mine face because they've been mining for so long. Uh, there's quite a long distance travel, but the lab we built is, is close enough that we simply just walk there. You can see here um, them walking in darkness with this head torch on. <clears throat> and you can see how dusty and uh, the surrounding is. So, you know, because of that, we now arrived at the lab covered in dust in our bright orange mine gear. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the lab is a clean room, so we need to get changed before we're allowed to enter. Um, so we first use an air shower to remove most of the dust. Then we cover our mine suit with this beautiful white overall, which doesn't allow dust to escape. And then we have boot covers, as you can see here. Uh, and then a new helmet, which is different to the outdoor helmet that we're wearing. Uh, and then we're ready to enter our clean room lab. Soon you'll be able to take a 3D virtual tour of the underground lab itself on the Bulby's website. So stay tuned and check that out. It's really, I've seen the tour. It's very interesting and very cool. Um, and you can also then check out some of the other facilities that we have, such as Britain's deepest toilet, which only existed since 2017, uh, and our working kitchen, which is always fully stocked with biscuits, which is always a delight. Um, but now you've seen the current dark matter laboratories, I would like to show you the latest uh, UK dark matter experiment. So to do so, we have to move home a little bit over to the US and the Homestake mine that was mentioned earlier, located in South Dakota and the home to the Lux detector, which uh, predates the, my current experiment. So Homestake is now, uh, it's called, uh, now called the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Uh, I took this photo in 2019 when I was there. Uh, and in fact, it, it often looks like this. Uh, so this could have been taken any time in a nine year, a nine month of the year period because it snows a lot in South Dakota. Um, and then, you know, even as late as end of May, as early as September. So, you know, but it's a beautiful, beautiful landscape, which I, I always appreciate. And the lab itself is set in an old abandoned gold mine located 1.6 kilometers deep underground. Uh, so quite a little bit deeper than Bowlby. And once you're in the tunnel, uh, you know, when you get underground that deep, you remove your background radiation coming from cosmic radiation by a factor of 10 million. Um, so, so, you know, a, a mile of earth is acting like the outer shield of a Russian doll. Uh, but the walls and the rocks around the lab is still giving off some radiation. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to build a giant cavern and inside that place an outer water shield. So this further removes most of the radiation coming from the cavern itself. But inside the water shell, we have another shell full of liquid scintillator uh, to further remove our backgrounds. And then once uh, and, and inside that sits our, a, a very clean outer titanium shell of our detector. And then within that shell, there is a further inner titanium shell, which is even cleaner than the outer shell. So with each smaller shell, the material we make it out of is usually of much cleaner material than the previous one. But the reason we don't just use the cleanest material for everything is because it's incredibly expensive and time consuming to find so much clean material. So finally, inside the inner titanium shell, we have our xenon. Um, but as a final protection, we actually sacrifice about a few centimeters of that xenon all the way around the detector. So where the xenon touches the titanium, it, it's sacrificed to protect the, the cleanest xenon that's in the inside. Um, and that is just about the cleanest shield we can possibly make. So at this point, we have made one of the least radioactive spaces anywhere in the universe. Um, and now we wait for the dark matter to flow through the detector and if our theories are true, smash into the xenon atoms uh, because when they do, it gives off a little burst of light which can be picked up by our ultra sensitive light sensors uh, <clears throat> which are located on each end of our detector. As you can see here in the video, you have these flashes of light and then these light sensors pick them up. So. I think here you can see a little bit better, the dark matter particle flies in and smashes into the xenon and that causes a small burst of scintillation light. At the same time, some electrons are released which drift towards the top of the liquid xenon and when it reaches the top uh, end and the gas phase starts, uh, 
when it, when it reaches the top, the liquid phase uh, ends and the gas phase starts. This is why we called it the dual phase earlier. But when it gets there, the electrons cause a second, much brighter burst of light, which is again detected. So with each burst, by measuring the intensity, you can work out the X and Y coordinates using your light sensors. And then by measuring the drift time uh, between first and second light burst, you can determine the Z axis position, thereby allowing you to uh, reconstruct exactly in three dimensions uh, of your detector and where the event took place. <clears throat> so, okay, so that's all very interesting, but what have we actually seen so far? Well, um, nothing, um, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> at least nothing credible, uh, more importantly. Uh, so with the Lux detector, we were not able to see clear dark matter signals. So. So, I mean, I guess you would ask, what's next? Uh, well, first we have to put it into a museum. That's what we've learned, uh, what we do with these old dark matter detectors, of course. So the Lux detector is now at the Homestake Visitor Center. Uh, it went from the world leading dark matter detector in 2015 to a museum piece in 2017. So that just gives you an idea of how rapid the field is moving. But next we published the fact that we saw nothing. Um, <laughs> in dark matter physics, our plots often look like this, something like this, uh, but I, I never find it very particularly visualizing. So I like to demonstrate my plot to look more like this one. So if we say dark matter is the magic unicorn in the forest, uh, we have essentially ruled out. The, uh, so this is our forest. And we've kind of looked into this area and said, we haven't seen any unicorns hiding out there. Uh, but it might still be hiding out in these other areas we've yet to explore. So the way we can further probe this unknown region is that we're going to need a larger detector. And that's typically how you get to, to further um, these parameter spaces, as they're called. So I've shown the Lux detector, which is one of three competing dark matter experiments around the world, the other two being Panda and Xenon. And LZ switch... Uh, and then, so when, when um, Lux switched on 2013, Panda uh, had more Xenon, it switched on a bit later in 2016, and finally Xenon one ton switched on 2017. So you see here, uh, there are, you know, there are, oh, so you see two weights here, uh, one in bracket. That's because, as I mentioned earlier, we sacrifice some Xenon. Uh, so one is the total Xenon, and the other is how much Xenon is left after, after you sacrifice that outer region. So we're, we're currently on the brink of the current generation of dark matter detectors, which is kind of taking over from this gen older generation. Uh, and that they are in order, I think they might, so I'm gonna put them in order, I think they might come online. Um, but the exact date has been very secretive and nobody really knows because everyone's competing against each other to be the first to switch on. But I suspect that Xenon Inton will switch on probably first uh, at the beginning of next year, followed very soon, very closely probably by, by the L, uh, LZ experiment. Um, and, and then uh, possibly Panda will have a, another experiment that follows closely after that. But we will see, uh, and they will all contain Ton, uh, 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 many ton, uh, ton scale xenon uh, in their detectors, and then uh, ranging from 2.8 to 5.6 tons. These experiments will then operate for the next three to five years. And I think it's, it's hard to uh, tell just, you know, the scaling up of these between each generation. So I always like to include one generic physicist here for scale. Um, so on the left uh, here, you see the Lux detector, and then on the right is the LZ detector. So you can just see that how much bigger uh, this, this new one generation is separated by. And the name LZ stands for Lux Zeppelin, as the collaborators are a combination of the UK and US experiments. So Zeppelin and then Lux. Um, so here are just some pictures that was uh, taken over the past two years of construction. Uh, on the left, uh, you uh, you know you have our light detectors, which we saw earlier, the eyes of the detectors detecting those flashes of light being cabled up. And you can see that the, what the detector uh, looks like face on. Uh, once built and inside the titanium cryostat, the whole detector is then lowered into the mine. Uh, you can see in this middle picture here. And this was a very stressful process because there was only one inch clearance on each side because we wanted to make the biggest detector we possibly could, uh, but that really limited uh, how much flexibility we had getting down our uh, shaft. Um, 
so and then here the detector is finally installed inside our water tank uh, on on the on in December uh, the twenty first of twenty nineteen. Uh, just before I flew home for Christmas. So yeah, so we were glad they we would seal it up in time for Christmas time. Um, so here's a photo of the collaboration taken in sunnier and, and less COVID times. Uh, the LZ collaboration consists of about 300 scientists, technicians, and engineers from 38 institutions in five countries. Uh, and then, yeah, so watch out for our first data if all goes well in 2022. So slight, slight change in that date there, I should probably update. But, you know, some, some might say it could go one of two ways, I suppose. If nature is kind to us, then a discovery will mean a short trip to Sweden and a Nobel Prize. But if we see nothing, then it will be back to the drawing boards. Uh, and of course, that means going bigger still. So there's already plans underway for uh, the, the experiments to merge for a next generation dark matter detector. And, and for such an experiment, the only way forward will be combining global efforts because it would, it would require a, a large, you know, a very large amount of xenon. Um, and it'd be a very exciting challenge. And I, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to working with, uh, you know, a wider international uh, collaboration of colleagues on, on this large scale project. Um, and even if we do find dark matter with LZ and xenon n um, such a detector would be incredibly useful then to further study in detail its exact properties. So that's why plans are already underway to, to develop this next generation, ne next generation of dark matter detectors. And lastly, I just want to say that, you know, this is a really exciting time for particle physics and in particular dark matter physics, because after, you know, waiting for a really long time, uh, we at last have the technology to build the detectors to really explore vast regions of the forest that we saw earlier, uh, where our elusive unicorn might be hiding out. So, yeah, so I, I encourage anybody out there who might be interested uh, or who's thinking about career choices to, you know, really consider joining physics and it's a great time to join the search. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any question you have. And I, I would just like to point out this photo uh, is, is captures the moment, uh, my first and only ever hole in one in golf, uh, but the, the hole was two miles wide, but nonetheless, I did do it. So that was very exciting for me. Thank you very much. No one will take that away from you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. <laughs>